Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, tonight, I should say, this evening. Um, my name is Rachel Adams. I'm the Chief Curator and Director of Programs at the Bemis Center. Um, I'm actually at the Bemis Center right now. So if you hear some noises, it's probably because the residents are working upstairs. Um, and yeah, welcome to our conversation with Nadia Botello. We are um, really excited to have this program tonight and sort of the, the secondary main event um, next Saturday on October 2nd. Um, I'm just gonna go through a few slides and some housekeeping and then uh, we'll get started. But um, we'd love to know where you're viewing this from. So if you wanna use the chat and tell us where you're um, tuning in from, where in the world you are, that would be wonderful. It's always nice to find out. Um, if people are local or non-local to Omaha. Um, if you are not familiar with the Bemis Center, uh, we are a 40-year-old contemporary art center located in downtown Omaha, Nebraska. We um, have an artist residency, so we host artists from all around the world. Um, around 35 people per year come and live and work here. We have an exhibition space on our first floor that's open to the public. Um, and then we have a performance venue in our basement called Low End. That's part of our sound art and experimental music program. So that is sort of the three branches of Bemis. Um, we do lots of things all of the time. Um, and yeah, if you want to follow us, you can do so on our social media and website and all of those technological things that Davina can chat into our chat. So. Um, so we're here tonight to um, have a conversation with Nadia Botello, who is going to um, be here next week um, to premiere Other Channels, which is a performance that we're going to be doing on the River City Star. Um, it has sold out, but we do have a waiting list. So if you haven't, um, if you weren't able to get tickets, definitely sign up for the waiting list. Um, because it is free, some people sign up for things and don't come. So if you really, really want to come, you can definitely try just to show up um, at the River City Star, um, which is like basically on the way to the airport in Omaha, um, at you know just before 3 p.m. on the 2nd, and we might be able to get you on the boat. It's just a, it's a small capacity boat, so um that's that's where we are but definitely try if you're if the, you don't make it into the into the list okay um just a few other things that are happening at bemis over the next few months we are actually um getting ready for our benefit art auction and um exhibition and member preview which is october 14th so auction artwork is starting to come up the stairs and we're going to get that on the walls. So um, we'll be um, posting more about that. But if you're an artist or if you're a member, you're welcome to come to that preview to see all of the artwork in person. All of bidding will be online again this year like we did last year. Um, our fall residents have arrived and are working away. We're going to do a talk, um, art talks with them on October 20th in person. So you can RSVP for that. Um, it'll be a good chance to come see what's up in the auction and just get to learn about the artists and their process. They each do like short, you know, six minute talks. Um, you can mingle with them afterwards. There might be a performance. So keep an eye out for that if you are in the Omaha area. And then actually like our big benefit art auction and concert is on October 29th. And this is going to be kind of a indoor outdoor thing. We're having a big tent across the street. Um, everyone is going to have to be vaccinated or show a negative test to come in. Um, we're trying to keep everyone as safe as possible while also being able to celebrate. And um, this is a really integral, our, basically our only fundraiser that we do at BMS, um, showcasing some amazing art from both local artists and national international artists. So um, it's a really fun party and we're going to have um, a really great concert afterwards, which we haven't announced yet, so I won't say who it is, but um, the concert is actually free. So um, if you want to just come for the concert afterwards, that's, that's also something. Um, so just keep an eye on all of our communications and more about that will come out probably very soon. Um, I just want to thank our sponsors for um, helping make this program possible. Um, Other Channels is funded by the Mid-America Arts Alliance, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the State 
our agencies of Arkansas, Missouri, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Texas. Um, and then additional support is provided by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. So thank you to them for uh, making this happen. I have now like moved my grid thing and I can't see it. Okay, there we go, sorry, <laughs> Zoom. Um, and then, you know, we also try to keep everything free at Bemis as you, um, you may know. So, um, you know, we can really do that by counting on um, support from people like you from viewers like you, like PBS says. So um, if you want to join as a member, that would be a great way to support us. And then you get to come to a lot of our um, exhibition openings and events and things like that, or just donating, um, you can do so at bemacenter.org slash support. Okay, that's the end of my slides. Nadia, you're here. We have a somewhat critical mass now, so that's great. And again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, Nadia Vitello. Um, Nadia and I met a few years ago. Nadia is actually um, a Bemis alumni. She was part of our um, sound exhibition in 2019 called Inner Ear Vision, which she'll show a piece um, or work from that body, from that body of work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we were able to really um, e expand what um, what she did here into this new performance, um, which we've been talking about for a while and has sort of, you know, um, been kind of percolating, I should say. Um, and now it's actually happening next week. So it's really exciting. Um, and yeah, we're just gonna kind of have a conversation. This is casual. So if people have questions, please chat them in. We might just like unmute you at the end. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna, Nadia, you, you take it away for now and I'll just chime in when it makes sense to chime in. Does that sound good? Sure. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think you inherited me actually like three years ago in this project. <laughs> so we, it has been, I think you were just, starting yeah it's it is it's really great to um be approaching the actual premiere of this piece next week i'm very excited but yes it's also gone through many many iterations so can everyone or can you see my screen rachel yes i can see your screen okay um i don't like doing lectures so i'm very glad that this is a, a conversation i really want to encourage people to chat or participate come off mute actually see like i think a, at least one set of best friends in here wow. <laughs> and, and um don moses who was actually like integral to the research of this piece he's a retired civil engineer for the army corps of engineers um i'm incredibly grateful for the conversation that we had um, when i visited in march of 2020 and it was right shut down <laughs> it was literally the weekend that the world shut down from COVID. <laughs> so it was uh also quite an experience um getting everything together then but we had a great conversation i actually might um bring some of that up later and see if don wants to chime in once we get to talking about the project but yeah and don will be on the boat with us um so i didn't really kind of describe that but um we'll be doing a kind of talk on the boat with don as well as jack phillips and shannon um bartelt oh my god like totally lost her last name, um, who's a professor at UNL. So the three of them with Nadia are gonna chat about the river and then we'll have a kind of intermission and then the performance will happen. So it's yep. be really, really nice next week and it won't rain. <laughs> no, it won't. So I'm gonna, so I also do not like going over my sort of official file if you've read the blurb about me and I th and I think I know half of you in this room right now so you also know something <laughs> about me so um I actually wanted to put just a couple things up here and invite Rachel to pick a couple and I can talk about it because okay. this is stuff that people uh you would not read in my normal bio or 
You wouldn't know unless you were pretty close to me. Okay. So I would like you to talk about um, being a synchronized swimmer. I would like you to talk about the ladies pinball crew, bells and chimes, and then also your karaoke dancing in the dark. I feel like those are my three top three right now. All right. Okay. So yes, I was a swimmer from the age of six to 16 and competing. I um, was eventually seventh in the nation. I spent basically half my life underwater. And when you're a synchronized swimmer, you hear the music underwater. We use underwater speakers and the counting like you do and say like dance or you know ballet, jazz or music when you need to keep time. It's actually for when we're above water because the, the acoustics of the pool, you know, if you've ever been in an indoor pool and you service and you just hear like all this noise and add an audience in and you, you can't hear the music, you can hear the music perfectly there because you're hearing through your bone structure. So, you know, I, I swam to classical music and a lot of different, well, actually technically my first solo when I was six years old was to Ace of Bass. I saw the sign. So that was, you know, we had kind of little fun things, but once you got into the more competitive level, then you were swimming to classical pieces largely at that time. Um, so it was in really, really influential for me because I have always been a very physical listener. I'm much more interested in how sound affects your body so even my i come from a very long line also of pianists and so when my grandfather would be playing the piano i we had an upright piano and i would make a camp and i would and sit underneath the piano with my back against um, the bridge basically and I would listen that way and it's still my favorite place to listen to the piano is like underneath the piano or sitting up against it I just really like that experience and I think I mean it's because I was a synchronized swimmer everything I heard for 10 years of my life was just a very physical um, bone conduction experience and you'll see in some of these excerpts, um, it's really influenced my life. I mean, and my practice and, and everything, how I think about sound, where I think the primacy of sound should be. I don't necessarily think that sound is, is just um, an, an ear-based situation. I, I've done work that is accessible to the deaf community as well because they can hear the work through, you know, their bone structure. So I'm really interested in all of those interplays and th that's how synchronized domain um, influenced that. So let's see, the, the next one you wanted was ladies pinball crew. Definitely ladies pinball crew. <laughs> um, I love playing pinball. And I used to um, tour with metal bands in the day and, and all sorts of bands. Um, when I was a teenager and in my early 20s, I was living in Philadelphia and super involved um, in the music community there. And we had lots of pinball machines at like lots of local um, restaurants and kind of dive bars and things like that. And there's an app that when I was on tour, you it would tell you where the nearest pinball machine was. Um, so I would kind of go zone out and just go play by myself and then go back to the venue for the show or whatever. But one thing that I did that was really, well, Suzanne Ciani, I, I would be remiss if I do not bring her up right now. If Emily and Alicia are the Emily and Alicia that I think they are on this call right now, um, they are some of my closest friends. And Emily just sent me a uh, uh, a seven inch of Xenon. Xenon was the first pinball game that was sound designed by a woman by Suzanne Chiani, and it's super interesting. 
was, she's sort of the godmother of Buchla um, modular synthesis and very influenced by science and technology and is a classically trained piano player. So she's got all these really awesome intersections, but I um, came across Zine. I've only come across the machine a couple of times in my life, which is crazy. It's a very, very rare machine. Um, and I did a piece actually. So we're gonna test if the sound works right now. I did a fun thing where I took um, recordings of playing the game live and I turned that into different compositions. So I would use it to make loops and different things. So let's, let's, let's see if this works. I don't know if it will. Sorry, let's see. I have to do a lot of window arrangement to see my... <laughs> There here. Um, all right, here we go. And let me know if this is too loud. That's good. So it's just like a little um, piece, and then I did it for some other game well where I would make them. Turn them into compositions and like two seconds. Yeah. And that was a fun pastime in, you know, the van or the bus while you're waiting. So that is that. Um, I love pinball. I love the sound of pinball. One kind of dream exhibition of mine would be to get a machine and redo all of the art and actually do like a clear acrylic so you can see the inside of the machine and do all the sound design from scratch so that it's a playable composition so one of these days maybe we will we will have an opportunity to do that somewhere <laughs> i i also am a huge pinball fan and we have like a the arcade arcade thing here and that's basically like all I do is just play pinball when I go there <laughs> does your son play too he likes it yeah he likes it so he'll he'll get into it more probably as he gets taller <laughs> there is I need to be a little taller but there is um that. anyway I, really, I do want you to talk about dancing in the dark but I also feel like maybe we should like move more into the like I really want you to talk about water and that influence on your work because that's sort of you know where we're headed next next week anyway so yeah that yeah. makes sense. so the I don't know if you do you want me to just jump into this piece and do like an overview yeah I think that would be good yeah so this this piece <laughs> <laughs> was um, quite an interesting um, process. I oh, there we go. Sorry, that was my fault. <laughs> Clicked the wrong button. That's fine. Um, so. I was commissioned by Mata, which is Philip Glass's organization. They had their 20th anniversary festival. Um, it is the new music sort of premier festival every year for experimental music. And they wanted me to do something around water. And I wanted to do something that was more than just listening to music underwater. I've, I'd seen a couple people doing exhibitions around that. It seemed very spa-like to me, which is fine. I, I love the spa. Um, it's, that is one way to experience uh, work, but I was really interested in what the water would actually have to say for itself. Like what would the water sound like if it was singing out its resonant frequency? So. When I was in grad school, and I am pretty sure one of my <laughs> one of my great good friends from grad school is also on this call. Um, hello, Wayland. Um, you, she saw me 
creating this piece, but um, Bob Balecki is a really well-known uh, engineer. He helped, he basically invented all of Lori Anderson's equipment, you know, her vocoder equipment, all this stuff. He is the preeminent experimental music um, audio engineer and sound designer. And he let me use his backyard pool to make the piece, this piece. And essentially I got to a place where I figured out how to engineer this system without using um, a computer or um, the computer was there to capture this middle picture is the documentation of what the resonant frequencies and the harmonic nodes what was happening when we were doing sweeps of the pool um, but it was just using two pieces of equipment essentially an underwater speaker and a um, military grade hydrophone and being able to get it to the right sort of settings um, to let the water sing out its frequency. Every material has a resonant frequency. It's what happens when an opera singer, you know, breaks a glass, when they hit a certain note, it shatters the glass. Um, so this piece is the pool singing out its frequency. The audience eventually, once we premiered it at Mata, the audience got in the pool. Vinayak was there as well. He's on this call. <laughs> he experienced this piece and it is a live frequency. So when you go, you know, when you're swimming and you go like this, the water literally goes and you hear what other people um, are doing and you hear above water, it's activating the harmonic nodes within the space of the pool below water, it's activating other harmonic notes. You're literally swimming through sound and you're swimming through the water where it's reached a frequency that it's singing itself out. Um, I did have to make people sign a health waiver because it's such an intense experience. It's sort of borderline like pleasure pain zone. I did not want anybody that might have seizures or um, might be pregnant or could have a health issue triggered by this really, really, really physically overwhelming experience. But that's also what the water was doing. It's, it wasn't, I didn't make it, um, you know, pleasant for the sake of the audience. That's what the frequency of that pool was. So there's that, I don't know. You, did you want to chime in, Rachel? <laughs> My, uh, my buttons are like not working. Um, yeah, I mean, I was, I was sad that I missed this piece because I feel like, you know, as someone who also like grew up swimming, not synchronized swimming, but just like as a um, swimmer and diver and like spending all that time in, in water, like, I don't know, I would like, it just seems like such an amazing experience, especially I think for, um, you know, people that are, are used to like experiencing sound art, but maybe not in like that type of way where you're like, now you're going to get in the pool, you know, like, um, being able to like, really like, you know, pun intended, immerse yourself. Um, yeah, it just, it's sort of, um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting like connection between like your own, your personal experience as a synchronized swimmer and how that has sort of influenced like your work, um, you know, with, with bodies of water, whether those are pool or a river. Um, and I don't, do you want to talk about like where, um, you know, cause this thing is sort of interesting, um, when your work was here and like having like sort of, I don't know who's on this call and maybe they are not as interested in this as I am. So again, please chat in questions if you have them, but, um, like the sort of idea of the hydrophone and like where that kind of came from. Like, I feel like you have this like history of that, that maybe you can kind of explain um, a little bit, maybe if not like your own personal, like where did, you know, when did you first start using um, that in your work and you know, how, how has that changed like over time at all? Sure. Well, the history. <laughs> Two big questions. 
Yeah, the history of the hydrophone, um, you know, actually, let me see if I can go down. I'm gonna skip a couple slides because, so this, this workshop that I did um, at the University of Pennsylvania a couple years ago was actually about the history of different um, music technologies and how they have influenced um, many things. Um, it was sort of centered around Laurie Anderson just as a theme and a, a jumping off point. But I talked about where, you know, microphones and tape, um, tape machines that all comes from Nazi technology, quite literally. Hydrophones are military technology, quite literally. Um, it, it's where you, and, and field recording is also, I have really conflicted feelings about that as well. Uh, but all these things originate somewhere and what is the context of, what's the context that you are then using those technologies for your work? Are you even aware of the context? Are you making like specific decisions around how you use them, um, how you're presenting them? You know, these are all really, really important questions. And hydrophones, I, you know, I use them a lot. I use them a lot. I just, I, I think actually, because I couldn't come for the first exhibition I did at Bemis, uh, Raven Chacon uh, traversed to the Missouri with some pool noodles and like <laughs> risked life and limb to get some hydrophone recordings for me from the Missouri River. So I'm, I'm very grateful for him to, for doing that for me. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, the concept of, um, using a technology that started and still is in use as you know a, a military um, surveillance thing and sometimes weapon because they're using sonic um, they're using underwater sonic weaponry now um, and how that affects things like whales and you know the the whole ecosystem i have the piece I've been asked to do the Sona Aqua piece in like natural bodies of water and I refuse to do it because it would have like it would cause incredible harm to you know the, the fish or whatever is in there so wow. I just having having an understanding of where your technology comes from is really important and I also am an audio engineer and a software engineer and um I, I build a lot of my own equipment. That's kind of where the impetus for a lot of the things that I've done um, prior to this version of the other channels that we're gonna do. But um, I, I like to try to engineer my own systems to see where I can um, reframe technologies or invent completely new ones for how we, you know, experience and, and perceived sound and how can we push beyond um, different, different technologies of um, sound making. And it also goes back, you know, I could go on a, a long rant about the BBC Radiophonic Workshop and how um, the history of women electronic music came about. And that was really because they were um, excluded from having their work presented by orchestras. You had to notate traditionally, hand it over to a producer, then they would have to, you know, do this event with a symphony. And it just didn't happen for many people. So these women were using um, equipment that was not for sound. It wasn't, that wasn't necessarily, you know, the Doctor Who theme song that um, was done was out of a lampshade and you know some other stuff. So it's it's I think the intersections of the limits of technology, the history of technology, and where it could go for sound, for music, for everything is a really interesting space um, to think about when you're making work. Yeah, I think that um, being able to, you know, innovate in that way um, and still, right? So like, as you said, kind of um, 
knowing where your your equipment or knowing where like these technologies like originated and how you can kind of innovate them for maybe like a good I don't want to say like good purpose because it, you know sometimes we think that yeah like what, sonic weaponry and all of these things are are things that you know are being used against yeah citizens or being used um you know underwater that's hurting the ecology and so how can you kind of like switch that up to um to have a conversation about what that is right also um but yeah i don't know if you want to go back to the other um this couple. one yeah i mean i think this is yeah so this is one of the we have a piece from this series at bemis for inner ear vision but maybe you want to talk about how this originated a little bit i should actually update it because i haven't added bemis to this piece yeah but yeah this was um uh this originated um from an invitation from a friend who's a curator will owen um who is part of flux factory and little berlin and they do like very very you know out the, i don't know if anyone's familiar with either of those institutions but they do a lot of really they're very community-led very diy very avant-garde spaces um Flux factories in Queens, Little Berlin um, was in Philadelphia. I don't know if it's still a gallery at this point, but um, they, those shows are some of the most fun shows I've ever been to or even been a part of. Um, and this piece came about um, because I was trying to explore how to, well, a couple things. How do you kind of invert the experience of being immersed in a pool and hearing something through your bone structure without having to physically get in a pool because of the limitation of museums and galleries? Not all of you will let me build a pool into <laughs> your gallery space. Why not? So, um, how do you how do you how do you negotiate that? And the other two parts of that were how can this be made accessible to the deaf community? And the third part was bringing in the voices of the nearest bodies of water. So every time this series is done, we do, or I do, hydrophone recordings of the nearest river or ocean or whatever it is. And then I take that and I compose a long form piece entirely out of the hydrophone recordings. And so, the audience they you have to come and physically you know initiate contact with this piece with the different it's gone through many different iterations i did one at bard the center one is my first year crit and i made them or not made them i asked very nicely to use the science building instead of the galleries for this and so everyone like trekked over and um it was really a specific move on my part. Um, also, the uh, acoustics in there were much better than the dinky galleries that we have. So, um, is the case? Is say that again? So that's always the case. Yes. Uh, yes. So, um, you know, the fact that it's something that you have to come up and touch, which that alone, you know, you don't really do a lot in well audiences are nervous about it in galleries and, and museums and spaces and um then you're listening to the voice of the river although it's been it's been translated through the hydrophone and through my composition but it is entirely from that and then it's a very it's a highly interactive piece so those were like the three main jumping off points for the different versions that i've done and, and i i i like it i like that it's um accessible i like that it helps people pay attention to water because my kind of main overarching theme that i figured out after many projects working with water is that i i really am interested in what it means to listen to bodies of water and pay attention to what's happening in your ecosystem and rivers and things like that without being pedantic and without like lecturing about water um, 
science or lecturing about what's, you know, climate change, which is just so dire and it makes, it's overwhelming. It's really overwhelming. And Vinayak, who's on this call, has a PhD in um, biology. So he, he can chime in at some point too, but it's, it's really overwhelming to kind of just like read information, um, read the science, or just constantly be thinking about how the world is gonna end and water is gonna disappear. And so for me, one of, I think, I had a really hard time during COVID and being like, does it even matter that we're doing any of this work, like art? I don't know. Um, but it comes down to events like this, events like other channels and what I wanna do with that piece or what we are doing with that piece. It's having a moment for people to really slow down and pay attention in various different ways to water and how important it is for us, what the experience of it as a medium and a physicality is, what it means for ecosystems, what it means for you know us as humans next to this thing, what water means on its own too. You know, it's we we like to dominate the environment often, and so what what do these things um, what might they have to say for themselves? Like those are questions that I always have. Yeah, and I think what um, what I really love about the bodies of water work is that you can have this really like personal like experience and kind of conversation right with that that water. Um, you know, or you can have it as a group because depending on on the tank, like multiple people can kind of be around it. Or there's an image, I think, on your website of like one person listening and another person like kind of hugging their back. So it's like they're having this kind of like um, experience of it through that other person. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I actually had this conversation a little bit with uh, Maya Dunas, who's our sound artist right now and who I know is like really excited to meet you um, next week because she was like, yeah, don't you ever feel like we're just doing so much stuff and like nobody's paying, you know, like it's just, it doesn't even matter. And I'm like, yes, but actually I think it does matter because even those like little tiny like conversations that you and I can have or that, you know, a group of people can have that sort of, you know, have this, bring this awareness um, of, yeah, something like climate change is such a huge topic and it's frightful um, in many ways, but, you know, being able to kind of have a little bit of a, a switch where you're like, okay, let's, let's talk about water and how impactful that is and, you know, how we obviously need it to survive um, but it doesn't need us, you know, in that sense. So it's kind of like, um, let's, you know, let's have that awareness and kind of bringing that awareness, I think, through art is and through sound and music and experience and conversation. Um, it's like, no, we are, there is a reason we're doing this, right? So, yeah. Uh, I yeah. I, I mean, that, I mean, water beyond being this pleasant thing, you know, you can swim in a pool, you can swim in this controlled environment. It's also a terrifying thing. And we have Don Moses, who is the retired, you know, civil engineer for the Army Corps of Engineers who specifically worked on like the flood control situation for the Missouri River around Omaha. And you're having so much flooding, <laughs> so many flooding issues right now. And, you know, it's, we just had, another round of that in, in Texas, not in San Antonio, but you know, it's, it's, it, it is a, a devastating force at the same time of being a life-giving force, you know? So it's, it's really interesting um, to think about and, and engage with water. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think especially like not just water, but sound and water, right? Because um, yeah, there's, there's something that, you know, even, you know, again, like as a swimmer, like when you kind of come up and your, your ears are still like full, right. And you're kind of like that muffledness that happens where you still feel like even though you're out of it, you're, you're kind of still immersed in it. Um, 
you know, and you kind of get that feeling a little bit when you're against the bodies of water piece, because there's sort of this like muffledness that kind of penetrates you in a sense. Um, and I think gives you, yeah, like this kind of primal, I think that you used that word and Maya used that word earlier when she was talking about sound, which I think is really interesting that you both, <laughs> um, like, yeah, there's this like primalness that kind of happens um, with, with sound, our, you know, sound specifically sometimes um, that, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in like kind of how that is like explored because you can like feel it, you feel those vibrations, like, it's like you hear it, but you also feel it in that sense. So um, well, the same way that you do when, you know, things are like rushing by you, right? When you're underwater or in, in a body like that. And it's also literally in our bodies. It's like gestational as a child, <laughs> as an infant, you know, in somebody's womb, you're here, this same sort of you're in a fluid filled sack and you're yeah. hearing crazy stuff. I can't even imagine. I, I wish I could read that or maybe I don't, I don't know, but I, I feel like it has something to do with that as well. And, and that primacy piece of listening and, and water and overwhelming it can be um, in that way. Totally. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about other channels before yeah. I feel like we're at 742 and I want to like leave some time for this too, but if you want to touch upon anything else first. No, we can, I mean, it's, it's literally an extension of this whole yeah. line of thinking. Um, you know, I've, I've done more other work that has to do with sound and water and different iterations of it. And I also usually do a community piece of it as well. Um, where I usually engage with the community kind of extensively for a while and do research, but because of COVID didn't really happen for this piece. And this piece has, I think, gone now through like three different iterations. It was a to be a large scale um, installation that was gonna be like in your back room. And it was gonna have like all this, I was gonna engineer all these <laughs> different, you know, sound devices and it was gonna have multiple video channels. And I really wanted to get um, Los -Lo Sand, is it Lust Sand? I forget how, it's L-O-E-S-S. -S. They're like sand balls that only exist in Omaha up they were like blown into your bluffs for so it's like one of two places in the world where this exists and so I, i'm really that was part of my um conversation don as well is about sediment and all these all these different things but um so i i had extensive conversations with people but it wasn't on the ground sort of immersed um as much as i would have liked to and because of the COVID situation, I also was deeply uncomfortable asking people to come inside a building, like especially, you know, this project's three years in the making. And even six months ago, when we kind of restarted the conversation about doing it, I think in October, I was like, I don't know what's going to happen, you know, and I just didn't want people to go inside. So I racked my brain about like, what, it, what could we do? that would have an audience outside and engaging with this river. And so we came down to like a couple of options and one was just being on like the banks of the river and I really wanted a boat. <laughs> and so we found, we found the River City Star, which is like totally a steamer. It's totally kind of like tourist corporate. Hey, so, like but I don't care. I'll bring a parasol if I need to, but like I, I, I want, so in talking to a lot of people about the river, including Don and others, um, the Missouri adjacent to Omaha is so inaccessible. And it's so weird for me as a San Antonian. I'm ninth generation from um, South Texas, fourth generation from San Antonio. And if you've ever been or heard of San Antonio, you've probably heard of the Riverwalk. San Antonio River is insanely important. I did my master's thesis on that river um, and about the 10,000 year history of it. And 
it's it's really accessible to tourists it's accessible to locals you know there's lots of politics around it but there is no inaccessibility issue you can go there you can walk you can bike you can kayak now you can do all sorts of things you cannot even like get to the banks of the the missouri in omaha it's so hard to find a place to even like get next to it even in philadelphia where i lived for many years you know we're, we're in the middle of two rivers and you can run jog like all of that is available so it's it was a really interesting experience for me to talk to all these people, many of whom are local, multi-generational. We talked to a local artist, Jess Benjamin, who does sculptural work around um, the river and the agriculture. And I really love her works that are, um, what are they called, the Jack, Jackstones? Is that what they're yeah. called? Yeah. Like the water tower and Jackstones and it's, really lovely work and she's like i think fourth or fifth generation from the area and knows a lot about the water table and it was really interesting talking to her and you know all the drinking water for you all comes from this river and basically no one pays attention to it like it's an afterthought in the city and so for me getting people on a boat together having the whole event on this boat even if it's like a cheesy steamer boat i think will create this um intimate experience of where we're like collectively looking at and listening to the river in a way that not many people are used to in omaha and i think that alone is super special um and so because of the variables we're on a boat we're outside i couldn't I couldn't do what I normally do for work. I had to revert to <laughs> what's horrifying for me, but it's not actually horrifying, um, not at all. I had to go back to my traditional notation, like traditional <laughs> composition roots. And I was like, oh no, I have to do a string quartet. <laughs> and so we have arrived at a string quartet and I, I love classical music. This is like, no, it's just, I haven't, this is not the work that I have been doing for like 15 years. So it was a, in, it ended up being really awesome and a really great stretch for me to re-engage, like how to think about new music, experimental music, classical or experimental composition using classical techniques and classical instrumentation again after so many years of being like i'm never never gonna do that so, Get away. yeah yeah so i used like a century of usgs which is the united states geological service water data and i went through and um looked there's all sorts of data that goes back to 1928 for for the missouri river adjacent to omaha that was like my it had to be you know relevant so they were they were they were keeping track of things like the clarity of the river you know after a big storm or something and you know debris things like that and then eventually i think in the 60s or so i'm sure don is like in the background being like no those dates are wrong but um <laughs> the uh they you get like water level data you get all these different data points that the usgs is keeping track of around the missouri so i took all of that and basically translated all these different data points the and used historical maps as well um so this map is like one of the oldest maps that you can find of Omaha and of the river. And I immediately was like, that is, I mean, it's literally a loop, but it also looked like a score to me. Mm -hmm. I just weird and wired that way. Um, so I wanted also to use maps as well. So I'm just gonna move to this one, although I kind of already talked about different parts of this, but um, the, I took the maps, kind of took different pieces of it where the length of the river ended up being the length of the piece 
pieces of like where the tributaries enter or where the different voices of the in, the um, instruments enter um, the uh, the because the river is not natural at all anymore <laughs> I mean it is but it's been channelized and concrete channelized for shipping and for flood control and all those things um, the the flow it's flowing faster you know it used to be much windier and so that the the old flow level versus the new one the sets the actual pace of the entire composition where it starts out very slow and then it gets faster and and more complex as it goes on so all these different data points I translated to this score and then I worked with a wonderful arranger because I am working 10 hour days right now in my day job as a software engineer and, and product manager and um, it's the first time that I've actually hired somebody else to help me do a sound uh, piece and we worked very closely to arrange this because I just didn't have the time and she was really amazing she was recommended to me by Eugene Liu her name is Veronica and she um, is a violist a violin player classically trained but also works a lot with new music and choral um, different choral groups in Philadelphia and she knew exactly what I wanted to do so we worked really well and really quickly together to get this arranged so that the symphony could read it down really quickly without having to um, take a long time to learn this piece which was the part where I was like I can't I'm rusty with this it will take me like two months to have to arrange this piece in a way that you know, classically trained musicians um, would be comfortable learning very quickly and um, on a boat. So we, that's, that's- And on a, and on a boat, <laughs> to forget that we are gonna be on a boat moving down the Missouri. And yeah, it does move super fast, I feel. Like we went down there the other day just to get our rain plan in order, knock on wood, we're not gonna need it. But um, yeah, the, the river was moving extremely fast and yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of frightening um, when, you know, but also I, I, I'm excited for this because not being native to Omaha um, and, you know, living in Austin and living near San Antonio at points in my life and even living like, you know, just most recently in Buffalo, like access to the water was so easy. You know, you just can get in Lake Erie really easily. You can get, you know, in Lake, Lake Austin or, you know, Colorado River, you know, and so um, here, yeah, the, the fact that you said it's like an afterthought, I feel like that is very true. It's, it's a weird thing where people are like, oh yeah, I guess I just crossed over the river, like into Council Bluffs. Like it's like, you don't even think that you're like crossing this gigantic like body of, of water and, you know, how important that water is to us, so. Um, and that there's, yeah, it's not like a place like, yeah, in Philly or in Pittsburgh, even where people are just like on the river all the time. Cause it's just part of their, it's like ingrained, you know, in the fabric of the cities and it's not so much here in that sense. Um, so I'm excited to get people out there. Me too. And yeah. I'm excited to hear it. And, you know, it's, it's also a piece that it's not necessarily really um you know there are definitely beautiful movements in it but it's it is also very much trying to take a certain version of the river because these were the variables i had to work with so this is what you know the interpretation of um the data points and the maps being kind of like the most physical i could get of mm -hmm. The river's actual voice in this piece so there are parts where it's very frustrating actually as a listener because it's where it's hitting um the pylons uh i think they're called pylons. the pylons like in in the river and the infrastructure for uh, the flood control and everything like that so that's all actually built in so there are pieces later on in the third and the fourth movement where you 
keep feeling like you're hitting against something because it actually was you actually are yeah you actually are and so it doesn't give you that resolution that you would want to hear but you know I'm I'm really hopeful that also the river itself having we're out there so I want to hear it I think it'll be really interesting that it will have its own actual voice while we're on 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 the river and to hear it you know stream by and I'm hoping there's like an errant boat horn or two I don't know <laughs> I just I, I want to hear you know that environment and I hope it's it's yeah in Omaha probably more like helicopters than boat horns unfortunately yeah. but yeah <laughs> um yeah well, I wanted to leave a few minutes in case there was any questions or comments. If you want to, you know, you can feel free to like turn on your camera. I can unmute you also if you don't want to chat or if you just want to say hello. Um, but yeah, like I said, I think a lot of people on this chat besides Dawn maybe are viewing from elsewhere. So um, you won't even get to experience. You won't even have the chance, but Don will be there and I will be there. Nadia will be there. So, <laughs> recording it, um, audio. Yes, we're doing audio recording. So, so, hopefully, it'll be available after. Yeah. So, yeah. If anyone has any, anything, anything at all, anything at all, <laughs> it's totally fine. This was really fun to, to chat for a while. Um, and yeah, I think we'll, I guess we'll sign off because I'm not getting, I'm not getting any messages popping up. So um, we can say good night, but um, thank you everyone for joining us. And um, this was, sure. Logistical question. Sue wants to know how to be sure whether they have tickets for Saturday. Good. I'm gonna tell Sue. Sue, you can email me. Thanks, Waylene. <laughs> we'll make sure. Um, but yes, thank you all. Um, and yeah, we'll hopefully see Let's you all soon. Yep, I'm looking forward to seeing you and hearing the panel and hearing more about um. All of all of the awesome stuff the Army Corps of Engineers did. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be a really good group. Um, so, all right. Yep. Have Thanks. a good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Good night. <laughs>